Warm welcome to you this evening as we gather under the sound of God's word, as we gather as children of God to worship and to praise him. I bring my greetings from Hyde Heath Baptist Church. Uh, we know that um, my co-elder Philip comes over and preaches um, for you here. So we, I want to bring the whole congregation's um, welcome and joy to you from them to us here this evening. If you have a copy of God's Word, please open it at Psalm 104 and we will read verses 1 to 13. And I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version, this evening. Psalm 104, hear God's Word. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds. He ministers, his ministers a flaming fire. He sent the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You've covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys, they flow between the hills, they give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Besides them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. So read God's word. Amen. John chapter 10, verses 1 to 10. And again, I'm reading in the ESV. <coughs> Hear God's word. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly john chapter 10 verses 1 to 10 god's open door god's open door liverpool my city of birth and home for 33 years was recently voted the uk's best large city break by which now i can see that you're itching to go after me telling you that so what route would you take to get to Liverpool? M40, 
M42, then the M6, M6 tall if you're feeling a bit um, free with your money, and then the M62. Or instead, as, instead of going up on the M6, you could take the M54, the A41, the M53, which then would take you to the Birkenhead Tunnel, tunnel go under the Mersey and pop up in the Liverpool city centre. Perhaps you could go up and take the you go the A414, then the M1, then the M6, and then the M6 toll all the way maybe to the M62. Take the Nosley Expressway, then come into the past where I was grew up, South Liverpool, mm. and take the A561 all the way into the city centre. I can see those re roads really mean something to you. <laughs> but the point is, there are many ways to get to Liverpool. <clears throat> many roads to get to the same destination but do all roads lead to heaven the christian would say that there is only one way to heaven this is what this church believes this is what i believe but what about other religions like islam buddhism Hinduism, Judaism, Sikhism, that claim that you can get to heaven as well by following their religion. Who's right? When Christians are confronted with these sorts of questions or objections, we need to appeal to authority. We look to Jesus who makes the declaration that he is the entrance into heaven itself. In tonight's text, Jesus' declaration, I am the door, will teach us that salvation is exclusive and there is only one way of receiving eternal life. That is through him as the gate. Let me remind you that there are seven I am statements that Jesus makes about himself. And John records them all for us in his gospel. Remember that these I am declarations point to Jesus' unique, divine identity and purpose. The whole of chapter 10 is the last public address Jesus gives as recorded by John. Jesus uses an allegory with powerful effect. He uses the figure of the good shepherd to contrast his ministry to those who are false, witness, false shepherds. Jesus also stresses the voluntary nature of his sacrifice for his people. Jesus' fourth statement, I am the good shepherd, is the main theme of John chapter 10. And Jesus as the door is secondary, but still a necessary element. And we will study it tonight. The whole of this chapter should be read in light of the Old Testament passages, especially passages that chastise shepherds who have failed in their duty. That's spiritual shepherds I'm referring to. We also need to view this chapter from the eyes of the people in biblical times who understood what a shepherd was and did and how this imagery was used to emphasise the thought of sovereignty, one who rules his people. So this evening I have two simple points for us as we go through this passage. Firstly, the allegory from Christ. And secondly, the application to Christ. But if you're thinking our oh, two points will be over soon, there are lots of subpoints in between. So let's look first of all to verses 1 to 6, the allegory from Christ. In the original text, there is no break from chapter 9 to chapter 10. So it would read like this. From verse 40 of chapter 9. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, 
Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But no, but now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. The same group of Pharisees that Jesus calls blind in chapter 9, he now calls them thieves and robbers in chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus is following up his previous teaching with a significant statement. So Jesus says, truly, truly. Jesus uses an allegory in verses 1 to 6 to depict that he will gather a flock, a people for himself, out from the Jewish fold. So what is an allegory? An allegory is a story picked is a story, picture, or play in which the characters represent other things. An extended metaphor we can think of as well. So we must not make the mistake that many people do of trying to explain every detail or symbol mentioned in the allegory. We, uh, some people over-spiritualize these things and that's when we get into trouble. We don't want to get distracted and we need to stick to the main idea. So with that in mind, let's look briefly at the allegory. In verse 1, Jesus tells us that the symbol to take note of is the sheepfold. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Here we have a sheepfold. In biblical times, it would have been a walled enclosure, mostly open to the sky. The sheep would have slept that night in the fold to escape from the elements and from predators. It had one entrance and one exit, a bit like your car park. And it was secured by one single door or gate, guarded by a (coughs) gatekeeper. If someone tries and enters the sheepfold by another way, i.e. over the wall, their only motive is to deprive someone else of their property with the possible use of violence. Hence, they are called a thief and a robber. Verses 2 to 3 talk about the shepherd and his call. The shepherd has the right to enter the sheepfold, call the sheep out by their name, and then lead them. Jesus builds upon the imagery of the shepherd in verse 4 and 11 to 18. An important point to remember is that the shepherd leads the sheep, verse 4, which is very different to what we see shepherds today who drive their sheep. The sheep follow the shepherd because they know his voice. In verse 5, Jesus ends by saying that his sheep will never follow a stranger and will run away from them because they don't recognize the voice. John tells us in verse 6 that the Pharisees did not grasp or understand this this spiritual truth that he was teaching. So we may not understand it. So let's get a grip of the culture and the context. Understanding this, the culture and the context. This is like a sub point for us. To help us to understand what Jesus is helpfully teaching we need to understand a little bit about the ancient culture, especially of sheep and shepherding. Sheep are helpless, straight up. Sheep wander from place to place. They can easily get lost. They don't have this homing instinct as other animals do. They are totally incapable of finding their way to their sheepfold even if it was right in front of them. By nature, sheep 
our followers. If the lead sheep steps off a cliff, the others will follow. Sheep are also easily susceptible to injuries and are utterly helpless against predators. If a wolf enters the sheepfold, they wouldn't be able to defend themselves. They may try and run a little bit away, but huddle together, um, but they don't really scatter and, def uh, and go on their own way. They would huddle together, and then what would happen to them? They would be subsequently devoured by a wolf or another predator. And if sheep fall into moving water, they can't swim, so they will drown. Sheep are totally dependent upon the shepherd who tends, them, who tends to them with care and compassion. Shepherds were the providers, guides, protectors and constant companions of sheep. So close was the bond beyond shepherd and sheep that to this day Middle Eastern shepherds can divide flocks that have mingled at a well or during the night by simply calling their sheep who know and follow their shepherd's voice. That's one advantage that they have, the good listeners. Shepherds were inseparable from their flocks. The shepherd then would lead the sheep to safe places to graze and make them lie down for several hours in a shady place. Then, as night fell, the shepherd would lead the sheep to the protection of a sheepfold. The sheepfold in the allegory is described as being in the care of a gatekeeper, whose duty it was to guard the door to the sheep pen during the night and to admit the shepherds in the morning. The shepherds will call their sheep, each of which knew its own shepherd's voice and would lead them out to pasture. With that understanding in our minds and that background, I have three observations from these verses, verses one to six. So Jesus used this allegory, point number one, in these verses to depict that he will gather a flock. Jesus will gather a flock, verses one to six. Verse three informs us that he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus is still doing this today. He calls people by name. I remember when I heard his calling back in January 1996. He called me out as I was listening to a sermon from the book of James. Have you heard his calling? Are you hearing his calling? Who is Jesus talking to directly in these verses? Remember what I said before? The Pharisees, verses 1 and 6, tells us. Although it is clear that there are others who would have heard, as we read in verse 21, Jesus calls the Pharisees thieves and robbers. Why? They have got to their position without the blessing of the gatekeeper. They are not authentic and faithful shepherds. Jesus calls them strangers in verse 5. Verses 1 to 6 are an allegory of what has happened in chapter 9. Jesus just called a blind man to himself and made a worshipper out of him. But the Pharisees are heartless towards the man. They claim authority but have no care for this sheep. So we see, firstly, that Jesus used this allegory to depict that he will gather a flock. The second sub-point is that Jesus gives us a vivid picture of a false teacher of religion in these verses. We get to see what a false teacher looks like. Unfortunately, we're used to con artists, aren't we? 
whether they come knocking on your door and try and sell you something or whether the phone rings and it's one of those another nuisance phone calls trying to get your bank details or maybe it's one of those phishing emails that you receive in your inbox but it's a mo not a modern day problem one famous con man is Frank William Abigail Jr. Have you heard of him? His life was so outrageous that a feature film was made in, 20, in 2002 by the title Catch Me If You Can. And then a Broadway musical and then a TV series was created based upon the book. Frank Abigail Jr. was a Czech forger, an imposter between the ages of 15 and 21. He became one of the most notorious imposters, claiming to have assumed no fewer than eight identities, including, are you listening, an airline pilot, a physician, a US Bureau of Prisons agent, and a lawyer. He escaped from prison custody twice, once from a taxiing airliner and once from a US federal penitentiary before he was 21 years old. He served less than five years in prison before he was offered the opportunity to work for the federal government in the USA. And he is currently a consultant and lecturer for the FBI Academy and field officers. Sadly, ordination of a man into the pastorate of a church is no proof that he is fit to show others to the way to heaven. There are kind artists in the Christian world. Even these people who have been set apart by the local church, it is, a, it is possible that these people's lives may have never come near the gate. Christ himself is the gate. A person must truly be converted before they can lead others to Christ. A true shepherd of God's flock must be completely committed to Christ. His only desire should be to glorify Christ, not relying upon his own strength, but Christ's. Preaching the teachings of Jesus Christ and the whole counsel of God must be his priority. He must seek to always elevate Christ and lower himself. He must be a pastor after God's own heart. A false shepherd will enter the ministerial office with little or no thought of Christ. He will be self-seeking and his motivation will be to promote himself and gain public respect. Some view the position as a respectable job and position in society even till this day. They don't have a servant heart attitude toward a God-led calling. And J.C. Ryle, first bishop of Liverpool, said, Unconverted ministers are the dry rot of the church. The third point that we can draw out from these, past, from these first six verses is that biblical Christians hear and know the voice of of the true shepherd. This revolt, uh, results in them not following a stranger and running from them. Biblical Christians have been given the Holy Spirit. He indwells in the Christian. He equips Jesus' disciples with a spiritual instinct which enables them to distinguish between true and false teaching. Brothers and sisters, we must pray daily that we may be kept from the influence of false shepherds. 
We need to have a discerning spirit. How can you um, discern what someone says if you do not know God's word? You must be Christians in the word, reading it daily. Then we can pray for the Holy Spirit's help to know the difference between law and gospel, truth and lies, the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of man. We pray that the Spirit should help us all in these matters. That's the first point finished. We come to our second point, the application to Christ in verses 7 to 10. The application to Christ, and this is glorious, brothers and sisters. In verse 6, John records that the Pharisees did not spiritually understand the truth Jesus was teaching. They should have known the Old Testament scriptures regarding the idea of Jehovah as the shepherd and his people as the sheep. Jeremiah and Ezekiel speak about evil shepherds. Ezekiel also speaks of the great son of David, the Messiah, who would be one who would um, be one shepherd of the people of God, as we read in Ezekiel 34, verse 23, the one shepherd of the people of God. As they don't understand Jesus' words, he seeks to explain and adds further detail to the allegory in verses 7 to 10. It's an explanation and amplification of what he has just said. Jesus declares himself as the door in verses 7 and 9. Remember, there is only one gate to the sheepfold. Sheep and shepherds can only enter through this one point of access. There is no other way. But Jesus does provide the way. Jesus is not saying that he is an actual door. But spiritually, he is the access point of salvation. Jesus is declaring that he alone is the only one whom anyone obtains legitimate access. There is no other way. Those who enter into the sheepfold gain access to all the blessings of salvation. More on this significance of that in a moment. But as we see in verse 8, Jesus contrasts himself with those who have gone before him, i.e. the Pharisees, whom he describes as thieves and robbers, as we've seen. It's also possible that Jesus had the whole of the Jewish hierarchy in mind when he said this. The Sadducees made a lot of money out of temple religion. The Pharisees and the scribes were accused of having a covetous heart. No, Jesus says that they are, not were, thieves and robbers. They are thieves and robbers. This is their current state. The implication is that if people are to bring other people into the sheepfold of heaven, they first must enter it themselves. Jesus then reminds us that his sheep, biblical Christians, don't listen to the false shepherds, those imposters, but hear and obey the true shepherd. And this, in verses 9 to 10, we see two glorious blessings of salvation. Listen again. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I said I wanted to draw your attention to the blessings of salvation. Jesus promises two. So let's look at them as we bring this message to a close. 
These promises are not mine. They are not the church's. They are Jesus's. So listen up. Firstly, you will be saved. Only those who enter through Christ can claim this promise. Him and him only can you enter into salvation. No other person, no other religion. This is why a Christian can say that there is only one way to heaven. That way is through Jesus Christ who is the door. Those who believe the gospel and repent of their sin, it is a resounding position, will be saved. No ifs, no buts, no uncertainty, will be saved. Not for a period of time, but will be saved and will never perish. And no one will be able to snatch you out of Jesus' hand. Verse 28. But sometimes our human minds doubt this. There are occasions when we waver in full accepting this promise. Brother, sister, hear Jesus' words again. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he, she, man, woman, boy, girl, will be saved. It's possible that some of us here this evening, or who will watch online, may have never come to Christ and gone through that door for the first time. I plead with you that you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Confess your sin to him now and he will save you and give you that insurance, assurance of salvation and promise of eternal life. Not only you will you be saved from the punishment from sin, but you will be saved from the wolves and thieves that come only to steal and kill and destroy. Safety from the enemy of Christ who seeks to ki steal, kill and destroy. The offer, the call is for you this evening. Enter into Christ's sheepfold and you will be forever safe. My friend, that's the first blessing of Jesus Christ. You will be saved. The second blessing we see is that Jesus promises abundant life. <coughs> abundant life. He just doesn't promise safety. He doesn't just want people to survive, but thrive. He doesn't just promise life, but abundant life. Life that overflows. A life of no restraints or restrictions. A life that is full of grace, joy and peace. Also, his people will go in and out and find pasture. Do you remember what Psalm 121 speaks about? And how the Lord will keep you from all harm. And he will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. We will enjoy liberty and freedom in Christ. No longer slaves <coughs> to sin and to the devil. This reference to the Pasha is that when we feast on God's word, the Bible... We will find all the spiritual nourishment we will ever need or want. This is what Jesus is referring to in abundant life. Do you know that? Are you cherishing it? Are you holding on to it? Are you feasting in God's word? 
Jesus promises protection and plenty, solid safety and deep soul satisfaction. <laughs> Abundant life is not about having stuff, <coughs> wealth, riches, your hobbies, whatever they may be. It's about having peace, having joy, having God. Psalm 118 verse 20 reads, This is the gate of the Lord, through which, we, through which the righteous may enter. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. Brothers and sisters, let us give thanks that God has answered our prayers and has become our salvation. Salvation is exclusive and there is only one way to receive eternal life. That is through Jesus as the door. Do not stand outside looking at it. The door is free and open to you. One day, this door will be shut forever. And people will try to enter, but not be able to do so. Stop standing outside, enter in and be saved and enjoy the blessings of Christ. Amen.